glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. You who go down to the sea, you who live in the islands, oh, if you live in the city, lift your voice and sing out. Sing out, glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God, you are the mighty God. Sing to the Lord a new song, sing his praise to the ends of the earth. Every nation tell it, declare it, till every man is heard. Sing out glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. <clears throat> well, good morning here from Sherman, Texas. As you can see, there's some numbers up here on the screen this morning. And uh, so I want to remind you that I will always open up a Zoom meeting at about 9 o'clock if you want to just join in and kind of have a discussion uh, about the study for today. And if I do, then you need to have the meeting ID and the login. And so what I will do is open up the Zoom meeting, and if nobody jumps in, then I'll do the the thoughts for the day, you might say, for the week, uh, as I usually do. So there is the meeting ID uh, for this meeting. And then you need to have, of course, the uh, you need to have the uh, login also. And so let me put that one up here for you, if you can. And there is the login. Eight four five three seven six, and so if you you go to join a meeting, the first thing you have to put in is the meeting ID eight nine two three nine two six five six seven two, and then you'll have to log in, and your login is eight four five three seven six, and so much for all of that. If we ever if we ever do that, we'll be we'll be ready to go. But either way. Today, we will, are in the 91st Psalm, and so we're approaching the 100 Psalm mark. <laughs> It'll take us a few more weeks to get there, uh, but we will. We will get there. I'm not real happy with uh, how the camera is working today. Let me see if real quickly I can make a fix here. Make it like I want to. Okay. That's much better. Well, this is the last day of the first month of 2024. Can you believe that? And so February comes along. Of course, Valentine's Day. Uh, I think this is a leap year. So there will be 29 days in, in February. But at any rate... 
now we're in the 91st Psalm. The 91st Psalm is a good jump off of the 90th Psalm. We're not certainly not going to go back and review that. You can uh, get on the, the church's Facebook, uh, YouTube page and, and to see it there. But uh, it, it is a jump off of it because we, in the 90th Psalm, we talk about basically that the Lord has always been our dwelling place. Uh, he's always been there for us. And maybe sometimes it appears that he's not, but he is. And don't question so much how God is working in your life, although you may not understand it. And I might take you to the book of Job just quickly there, that there are some things Job didn't understand about the way God was working. But he also knew, he also knew that he hadn't sinned to the point that he should be being punished. But in the end, he saw how God works. And in the book of Job, he got a, you might say, a refreshing view of who God is. And maybe that's what we need at times when things are out of sorts in our life, so to speak. Maybe we need to back off. Maybe we need to sit down with somebody and just get a refreshing view a, that rehearses just exactly who God is. And to some degree, that's what happens in Psalm 91. So it's a good takeoff from Psalm 90. I always start with a, with a question. And I think the question is today, in your life, in your life of service to God, in your life of, of walking by faith, I'm bringing that up because I begin a short series this coming Sunday morning here in Sherman at Parkview on walking by faith. Have there been particular aspects of God that you were depending on? That's, that's kind of a tough question because God is everything, right? But throughout Scripture, there are aspects of, okay, there are aspects of God that, that are somewhat pointed out more often than others, perhaps. And so that's, uh, that's uh, an important consideration. And so we're going to be using this psalm to talk about perhaps three. Maybe there's more. But there's three that I want to bring to the surface as we, as we read together and study through uh, this 91st Psalm. So as usual, let's break it down. This one uh, I've broken down into three sections. It could be broken down to more than that, or it could be all one section. But the, the first section of this Psalm is the first verse to verse 8. And... It's advising, it's encouraging people to trust in the God who protects. Trust in the God who protects. Then verse 9 and going through verse 13, it's trust in the God who provides. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And then the last three verses, verses 14 through 16, have to have to do with once again trust in the God who protects, okay? Or you could even say maybe trust in the God who brings peace. So there's different ways to look at it. And as I'm sitting here and doing this and trying to bring out these aspects of God, you could go back through this psalm and you could probably find other aspects of God. Uh, that would come to the surface, whether it's Jehovah Ropa or Jehovah Nisi or some of those other ones. So what I'm saying is it's really hard to differentiate one from another or to pick one out, because when you do, you're probably picking others out associated with it, because God is all in all. He's everything. But that's how uh, we've broken this down. And so let's, let's read together this 91st Psalm, and let's, I don't like to particularly stop when I'm reading, so let me, <laughs> I guess let me stop now, okay? We're going to be reading here in that first section, and we're going to, we're going to learn some 
terms, if you please, some identifier, identifiers of God. So note those as we read. We'll get through the next several verses, uh, verses 3 through 6, and we'll notice the kinds of things that God protects his people from. And then from there through the, uh, through the end of the chapter, we see, you might say, not the end of the chapter, but through verse 13, maybe what we're going to see is some guarantees. That may be, maybe promise is a better word. And then at the end, when we see again how God protects his people, we'll, uh, we'll see that those words again. So there's, there's some very, uh, almost sounds disconnected, but very connected words in each one of those sections that speak to the topic uh, of that section. And note those. When, I'm not going to stop and point those out as we read. We'll certainly come back to them. So let's begin in Psalm 91. Psalm 91 has no superscription, so it's not particularly attributed to anyone. If it was, if it was a continuation, if you please, of Psalm 90, then that would make it Moses, uh, supposedly. So we'll not spend a lot of time there. Let's just start reading Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions under his wings. You will find refuge. His faith, faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, now you, this should sound familiar to you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's almost as if the, the, the psalm in those last few verses changes spokesman. All the way through verse 13, it's perhaps God doing the speaking, or, or the psalmist doing the speaking to God, or maybe in behalf of God. And now it seems like, oh, cool. Now it is God. <laughs> now it's God who is talking. So many, so many pertinent and interesting things in this psalm, and we'll so not have enough time to run through all of them. But uh, let's just walk through it for just a moment. And as we walk through it, I'm not going to ask which God do you want. There's only one, but which which aspect or characteristic of God is particularly important or particularly noticeable to you in your life as you're going through whatever you're going through? So in the first section of this psalm, look at the many ways he identifies God. I tried to count them. The Most High, the Almighty, the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God. That's just one short of perfect number seven. But notice, notice what he calls him, the Most High, which was referred uh, to him uh, back in chapter nine, uh, Psalm 90. Most High, that means nobody's higher than God. 
then the Almighty. That means all powerful. I uh, I think I mentioned before, but the word in Greek and the word that would be used here in the in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of Hebrew Scripture, would be Pantokrator, which means all powerful. It's two Greek words that are brought together. Panto means or pos means all. And krator means power. In particular, it means creative power, the power to create. And so that's what he's calling God here. He's the most high God. He's the all-powerful God. What else do you need to say? Well, now I'm going to make it personal. He's my fortress. He's my refuge. That doesn't mean that David or Moses, who have wrote this song, has exclusive rights to that. We all have the right to that. We all can say, God is my fortress. God is my refuge. Both of those offer the idea of protection or safety from whatever may be, may be going on uh, in our lives or in the world for that matter. And so that brings up that name for God, the, the Jehovah, Jehovah Shema, the God who is there. If you wanted to just summarize it in maybe one statement or one word, the God who is there. And since the God is there, look at all the things that he protects us from. Now think about that. Deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Talking about trapping a bird. Okay, well, you're not going to be trapped. From deadly pestilence. And he's going to mention that again uh, in verse 6. And the interesting thing here is because in verse 6, he calls it the pestilence that my version says stalks in darkness. Pestilence that stalks in darkness. And an interesting translation here, and you may have that way in your scripture, this word in Hebrew really means the thing, the thing that stalks in darkness. You know, pestilence is, is is invasive diseases and things like that that spread throughout a family or throughout a community or throughout a nation or the world, such as COVID, you know, such as COVID did. But when you think about a thing, <laughs> a thing that stalks in darkness, oh, there's so many things that come to my mind. One, and I'm not sure how related to this it is, but when I think of, of death, and things happening in the dark, I think of that plague on Egypt, that last plague when the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed, and even the firstborn of the Hebrews were killed if they didn't have blood on the doorpost, and that happened in the dark. You know, weird, ugly, wicked, evil things happen in the dark, and maybe that's more what he's talking about here, because he goes on to say, that that happens in in the dark and then the destruction that waits at noonday so he really he really covers the whole day so if you if you take this whole section as it is in essence he's saying you know what the almighty does you know what my refuge and my fortress does he surrounds me he gives me comfort he gives me protection in every way every day now we have to uh, we have to understand a little bit here. You remember how many times so far in the book of the Psalms, when it was a psalm that David wrote, that he spoke to the refuge of God. God is my refuge. But that didn't make his trouble go away. The trouble was still out there, but he was receiving the refuge that God would provide, knowing, knowing that God would do that, which is kind of the guarantee of the next section in the psalm, which speaks to Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Here he's providing refuge and, and safety, so let's keep, let's keep reading here and looking. He says, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. Now keep in mind as we go to verse eight that he's talking about the wicked here. He says, they're going to fall they're going to fall, but it will not come near you. In other words, it will it will not happen to you. 
you will look only with your eyes at the recompense or the result of of the wicked and their and their wickedness and so the the wicked may indeed be punished but you're not going to be swallowed up in that why because you have faith in the almighty in the in the high the most high god as your refuge and as uh, as your fortress and so he, he he's going to continue here then and speak to jehovah jireh you've made the lord your dwelling place again the most high who is my refuge no evil shall be allowed to befall you no plague shall come near you and so we're we're looking here then at the god who provides that safety that refuge that fortress and that's jehovah jireh that god who provides that you might remember where that where that term for god springs up and that's when when Abraham has been commanded by God to take Isaac, his son of promise, okay, to take him up to the mountains and sacrifice him. And so Abraham and Isaac and his servants and uh, horses and all that are headed to Mount Moriah. And when they get there, Isaac looks around and says, well, okay, we have the fire, we have the wood, we, we can build an altar, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham says Jehovah Jireh the Lord will provide not sure how much Isaac bought it bought into that that young man and we know that the Lord did provide a sacrifice after Abraham was saved if you please from uh, sacrificing Isaac the Lord provided a ram caught in a thicket there's a lot of symbolism there I, I think you can see that in Jesus Christ the Lord did provide and so the Lord provides the Lord provides not only is God this shelter and this refuge but he provides that again I would say that may not make the onslaught go away but God is surrounding you and protecting you but there may be some things that we have to endure and so the command is to be is to be steadfast, be patient, be long suffering. And God is with us. So here we have the God who is there. We've had we've had the God who is there, we've got the God who protects, we have the God, uh, the God who provides. And then we have this interesting section. You might remember, as we you know, as we look at uh, verses 11, 12, and 13, where he will give command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Well, we could spend the rest of the day talking about that, but you know where these words are quoted for us, right? In the New Testament, both Matthew 4 and Luke 4, here's the temptation of Jesus, that Satan uh, sends Jesus' way. Takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. Says, jump off, just jump off. For, does the scripture not say, and then he quotes, he quotes these words. Of course, Jesus says, well, you're not going to tempt the Lord by God. You're not going to do that at all. And Satan has to try to move to another temptation. But the wording here is, is just so interesting as well as exciting. It says, you will, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. You will trample underfoot. Now, I, I'm going to turn over here to Matthew chapter 4. And just take a look at this. Okay. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And God said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. Okay. That's another scripture. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Well, that's kind of interesting that he didn't quote this whole passage. 
because after it says that, it says you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, the serpent you will trample underfoot. If all of this is talking about Jesus, then it's kind of making a reference to what happened way back in Genesis uh, chapter three, when the serpent was cursed and was told the seed of woman, you will bruise his heel, but your seed, that seed of woman will, <laughs> will trample you to pieces. You never know how parts of the Bible all come together, do you? At any rate, um, this is this is a a first or one of the early predictions of the coming of Jesus and what would happen in his life. And of course, it has it has similarly a double meaning for you and me. And that is. Every time we stand up to Satan in the name of the Lord our God, in the name of the word of the Lord our God, in the name of our Savior and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we deliver Satan a blow. Satan did all he could to do away with Jesus, and he failed. The only thing that leaves is for Satan to come after you and me as those who are walking in faith for the Son of God. Sometimes he's somewhat successful, but we can always make a comeback, right? Because the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. Sometimes his blows are severe and maybe set us back quite a bit for a while. But we can always come back. We have victory through the Son of God who claimed victory over the grave. So that's what I'm saying here. It's almost like we're changing voices here, you might say, as this psalm flows out, because it says, Behold, he holds fast to me. He, God, holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. And we, we get that Hezed love again, that steadfast love of God that's always there. It's, it's just always there. And so we're getting a glimpse here of the of, of Jehovah, uh, Jehovah, the God of peace, Shalom. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Always there. I will protect him because he knows my name. Surely that takes us to John chapter. 10, where in that passage describing the great shepherd, it also describes his sheep. And Jesus says, I know my sheep and they know me and I call them by name. What an, what an intimate, what an intimate picture that is of Jesus and his sheep, which is your Lord and you. Maybe sometimes we feel like he's a little bit distant. Maybe like those uh, those disciples that were in that boat when the storm came up and they thought, well, why are you back there asleep? Lord, save us, we're perishing. Well, no, they're not, because Jesus is with them. And he took care of the storm. He could have, he could have made the storm not even happen, could he not? But there's something about going through the storms of life with Jesus in the boat. So much more could be said about that. But we look at, see how this, this one ends. I protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. This almost goes back to Yahweh Shema, the Lord that is there. I will rescue him and honor him. With long, long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't it true that as we, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, walk through life at times only discovering what God has done in our lives well after the fact? And during that walk, wherever it was and whatever we were going through, we might have even felt, where is God? Why is this happening to me? When is he going to fix it? What's he going to do? And all of those things. And I'm, I'm not thinking that God gets upset with us for that. We're just 
we're just speaking from the depths of our heart and he knows what we're going through. But then it gets all worked out likely in a way that we weren't considering. And it turns out to be much better in, in ways that we hadn't thought about. And think, oh yeah, I see, I see how God was working, which ought to give us a boost to our faith to remain steadfast and walking with him in the future when things are going to happen. I'm saying a lot of things that I'm going to say in my sermon Sunday. Our theme for the Parkview Church of Christ this week, this year, is walking by faith. And I'm kind of opening that discussion in my next three sermons uh, about what that means to, to walk by faith. But there's a point that I'll make, and I'll, I'll repeat it several times in Sunday's sermon. A walk by faith will lead you to do things you never imagined you would do and take you to places you never imagined you would go because that's the way God works. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and may the Lord give you peace.